Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos and today we're going to talk about the Ann Wiggins Brown House behind me. I'm here in the Sandtown Winchester neighborhood um, on Pressman Street, if you know where that is. And this house is on Baltimore City's historic landmark list. Um, it is not here there because of its great architecture. It is not the Belvedere Hotel or the Senator Theater. And it's not here because of the important role the house played in shaping uh, U.S. history. Uh, think of other landmarks on the city's landmark list, like the Basilica, the first cathedral in America, and uh, President Street Station, the first bloodshed of the Civil War. But it's here because it's associated with somebody who went on to do great things. Um, other landmark list properties, like the Edgar Allan Poe House and the W.E.B. Du Bois House, um, are in this same category. And here, the house is on the landmark list because of Ann Wiggins Brown. If you are a Broadway aficionado, you'll know who she is. If you're not, I'll spoil the story. She is Bess in the Broadway musical Porgy and Bess. She breaks through a number of race barriers to get there, but we'll get to that. Let's start with uh, when she was born, 1912. She was born to Dr. Harry Brown, a prominent physician, and his wife, Mary Wiggins, who was a trained pianist and singer. That's probably where Anne got some of her talent anyway. Um, and they lived in this neighborhood uh, that was fast becoming a hub for uh, professional African Americans, doctors, lawyers, teachers, ministers, people like that. And it was only about four blocks off of Pennsylvania Avenue. When Anne was a young girl, say the early 1920s, um, Pennsylvania Avenue really uh, hit the big leagues. Um, it had venues that national stars came to and audiences sought out. It joined what was called the Chitlin Circuit. Um, uh, uh, places around the country uh, where the superstars performed. Think of uh, places like the Fox Theater in Detroit, the Regal Theater in Chicago, uh, of course the Apollo Theater in New York, uh, and our own Royal Theater here on Pennsylvania Avenue that got started in 1922 as the Douglas Theater when Anne was 10 years old. But she probably got her musical start before wandering over to Pennsylvania Avenue, both at home with her mother and at her high school, Douglas High School, um, which had a renowned music teacher, Llewellyn Wilson. Um, Wilson had trained a number of prominent musicians and saw talent in young Anne. He gave her, at age 12, when she started high school, gave her leading roles in all of the this, uh, school's shows. Um, incidentally, uh, coming up before her, five years before, Llewellyn had trained another kid who was also pretty good at singing and dancing. Um, his name was Cab Calloway. But Anne goes on, uh, uh, starring through high school, and then wants to continue her music training in college. The natural choice is to apply to the Peabody Institute here in Baltimore, which she does, and she's rejected. Not because she lacks talent, but because the Peabody Institute is refusing to accept African American students. A woman who Anne had sung privately for at private parties, uh, Mrs. Constance, Constance Black, um, the wife of the chairman of the board of the Baltimore Sun, found out that Anne had been rejected and encouraged her to apply to Juilliard. Anne does so and at age 16 is accepted as Juilliard's first vocalist, uh, breaking through a barrier there. She does well at Juilliard, in fact goes to graduate school at Juilliard, and it's in her second year that she reads a newspaper article that a composer named George Gershwin is writing an opera, that's what they called it back then, um, from a book called Porgy about African American life in South Carolina. She decides that's her ticket up and so she writes to Gershwin and asks for an audition. He says, yes, come on down and sing. Um, she sings, uh, she goes down and sings a couple classical arias. Um, she is uh, a classically trained after all. And then he asks her to sing a spiritual. At this, she gets indignant. Um, in her words, she uh, approaches him and says, why is it that you people always expect black singers to sing spirituals? Um, apparently, his reaction was pretty uh, emotional and strong. Um, in her words, she felt that he knew where she was coming from um, and at that point relented uh, and said all she wanted to do was sing a spiritual for him. So she ended by singing a song called uh, The City of Heaven. At the end of that, he doesn't say a word but stands up, walks over, and gives her a hug. He had found his best for the show Porgy. Over the next several months, um, he is still writing the show, and he constantly calls her up and says, Miss Brown, please come down here and help me work out uh, a new number I'm working on. And she, a little annoyed, says, well, I got to go to school, but after school, I'll, uh, I'll come and help you. 
And over that period, the show changes. Bess goes from a secondary character to a lead role um, with numbers like Summertime that, uh, that are smash hits. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the drafting, uh, uh, Gershwin recognizes, in a way recognizes um, Anne's uh, superstar status by renaming the show Porgy and Bess um, after her. Um, the show goes on Broadway to critical acclaim and then goes on a national tour where, uh, where Anne Brown runs into her second big race barrier. Um, and this is at the National Theater in Washington, D.C. They will allow African Americans to, perf to perform, but not to uh, see the shows. To this, Ann uh, Brown says, if my mother, my father, my friends, if black people cannot uh, come hear me sing, then count me out. Um, the theater has a problem. It is not Porgy and Bess without Ann Brown. So they relent and allow African Americans to see the show. Um, and cracks through that color barrier uh, back in 1936. At the end of the show, the, the theater reinstates its racist policies, um, but Anne has become one of the first uh, performers to use her superstar status uh, to fight for civil rights. She goes on to sing uh, in Europe and in Oslo, Norway, falls in love with an Olympic ski champion. I'm going to butcher his name, but I'll try here. Thorleif Sheldorup, I believe. They get married, and she uh, lives in Norway for the rest of her life, um, teaching, uh, teaching singing. So I'm going to end with two thoughts, though. One is, well, what about Peabody, uh, the school that denied her admission because of the color of her skin? Well, in 1988, uh, they maybe try to make amends for their wrong, and they bestow on Ann, Wiggin, Ann Wiggins Brown their highest honor, the George Peabody Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Music. Um, accepting that olive branch, she comes back from, Nor uh, from Norway to, uh, to attend the ceremony. The second thing I'll leave you with is maybe something to help me ponder uh, or even uh, shed some light on. And that is out of this house in West Baltimore, Anne Brown uh, goes on to an unbelievable musical career. And she's joined by other Baltimoreans, um, UB Blake, Chick Webb, Cab Calloway, Billie Holiday, Rivers Chambers, Ethel Ennis, the Orioles, all um, coming out of this cauldron of, of musical talent um, here in Baltimore. And I have always wondered uh, either what was in the drinking water or really what kind of uh, strong musical community um, was there back then that, uh, that uh, uh, so many superstars were able to come out of. So come on down, take a look at this house, um, think about Ann Wiggins Brown, maybe go over to the Avenue, Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, to the Avenue bakery and get one of their famous Pape's rolls. Um, and then think about all of the musical talent that has come out of Baltimore in that era, including Ann Wiggins Brown. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.